Hi, my name is Anika Ashi, and I'm the founder of Novel Nook. So let's get started on understanding what exactly this platform does. So Novel Nook is a two-sided ebook library that provides many advantages to both readers and authors. So using this platform, if you're a reader, you can explore a large variety of ebooks, while authors can use this platform to publish their work and reach a wide audience. So Novel Nook uses many tools such as personalized recommendations and other things you would maybe find on a social media platform. So maybe you're starting to understand that this platform is sort of like your average social media platform, but the twist here is that instead of videos or Instagram posts or something that you'd find on Facebook, you would find books instead. So this actually helps people that might not be that engaged into reading, and we'll get into that problem later. But authors would benefit from publishing books on this platform because based on the amount of followers, like if you were, let's say, a YouTuber, maybe you would get some incentive from the videos that you make on YouTube. So the same thing happens here pretty much. Um, so this interactive platform also provides a community for you to discuss about books or anything you'd like in general. So anyway, let's move on to the next segment of this pitch deck. So I would like to define the problem first. So like I said earlier, most people often prioritize their electronic devices over any sort of book. Secondly, people find themselves lacking motivation to engage with literature. And I think a lot of people can relate with that. And lastly, people can't keep a consistency even when they start reading. Now, let's see, um, let's move on to the next segment of this slide. So let's take a look in the market of this industry. So first of all, let's define our key customer needs. First of all, keeping a consistency after starting. Users will benefit from this concept of gamifying as it makes reading more enjoyable and interactive. Personally, I can relate with that because sometimes I pick up a book and I might not like be that interested in it. So using features like gamifying, um, using quizzes, or like earning some sort of reward after you do it really gives people more motivation to continue. Um, secondly, recalling information gained from literature. So often you might read a book and you might not remember like a certain like really important thing that they said in the book. So using the quiz features on Novel Nook, like you can recall easily what you read and whatever time you spend reading, it'll be a quality time instead of just reading like just because you have to. Thirdly, um, gaining others insights. So like I said earlier, this platform has a discussion um, area where you can talk with people and understand the book you're reading or reflect on what your thoughts are. And uh, fourth is motivation to read. So this sort of relates to the problem. So Novel Nook will help you set goals for yourself, like what to, what might you want to read or how much time you have to read. And it'll um, sort of be like your helper and remind you that, oh, you need to read now. So people won't lose their consistency. Um, next, we have the market size of e-learning for students in the US. So how many students are currently engaging in e-learning activities? So right now, out of the 9.14 million students in the United States, um, 5.8 million students in the US engage in online activities on a daily basis. Now that might even include social media or online activities could be anything. But following up from that question, are students in the US performing at proficient reading, reading levels? So mainly this um, business is targeting people that are like parents of elementary or middle schoolers that are concerned about like how much their child is reading. And um, according to the research we have here, 66% uh, of students in the US are performing below the NAEP level. And you've, you can see what that means. So they're not proficient in reading, and I think that this platform will honestly help them a lot. So that's our market size. Um, next, we have focal market segment of e-learning for students in the U.S. So first, we want to analyze how quickly is this market changing. In the past few years, following the COVID-19 outbreak, the e-learning market 
market has had significant growth. So as you know, lots of things were operated remotely and the use of artificial intelligence and other de developing technologies, the use of online learning is starting to grow because it mainly like helps people stay at a comfortable spot instead of having to go like somewhere physically. And even when they might not be that energetic, they can easily access like something they wanna learn. So if we look into the statistics here, the market continues to grow and it's, it's predicted that it'll reach a whopping $1 trillion by 2032. So the other factors like gamification and um, social learning included on this platform will also contribute to the growth of this platform to be specific. Um, next question we wanna analyze is how profitable is the e-learning market? As mentioned earlier, predictions in the value of the online learning market continue to rise as more people are continuing to accept this concept globally. So um, as you know, like, like I mentioned earlier, after the COVID-19 outbreak, people are starting to adapt this concept more. And like I said, it doesn't require any physical really engagement. So you can just be like not in the mood to do something, but then maybe like you want to keep your streak or something like that. And you suddenly have the motivation to like learn more. So now let's look into the statistics. In 2023 alone, the digital learning market reached three. 316.2 billion dollars in value and predictions say that in 2024 the value will increase to almost 185.2 billion dollars along with this the e-learning market does not require expenses like manufacturing or shipping which reduces operating expenses by a lot so you're gonna notice this in um, some statements like financial statements cash flow statements or balance statements that um we don't actually have a manufacturing cost, which saves a lot of like money when um, investing in this company. Uh, next we have, um, it's like a follow up of the previous slide. So mainly, like I mentioned earlier, our target audience is elementary students and middle schoolers, like their parents would be the main target for this platform because um, Often elementary and early middle schoolers get distracted easily through social media or something else like um, playing with their friends and they need a source of entertainment, but they also need something that'll benefit them at the same time. So a feature of gamification will help keep students optimistic and engaged. Additionally, kids at this age are often interested in sources of entertainment such as television or different games. So this sort of provides a game environment to kids like this. Um, second, what differentiates this product from others? So what makes Novel Nook different is that while there are other options that provide online reading services, which we're going to analyze in our competitor slide, they intend to resemble a traditional paper book. Additionally, on this platform, people can publish books as well for different audiences along with people who read the same genres. So this sort of collects like an amount of people and it helps people find what type of books they find interesting. So I think people are gonna like that feature a lot. Um, so here we have a little chart and it sort of shows like what our target audience is and what their income is and how they, like what's the likelihood that they might buy this. So over here, like in the main section, we have mid-aged adults, parents of middle schoolers, and parents of elementary schoolers. And this um, matches with what we stated earlier as our target audience is mainly like the parents of students. Um, so let's move on. The solution concept. So um, here we have a little prototype like of how this is gonna work exactly. And um, over here, we have a variety of options to choose from. So as you can see, you have books, audiobooks, newspapers even. Um, you can also get recommended books based on like innovating technologies, as you know, such as AI. And users can purchase a certain amount of books per year. So this is like where we get into how exactly is the company gonna make profit? So we're gonna get deeper into that later, but the overall concept is that you purchase like an amount of books or you purchase like, um, like for a certain amount of time, like for a month, for a year, and you can have unlimited books for that much time. Um, anyway, moving on, we have more 
prototype screenshots. So we have rewarding features which motivate readers to use the app more. Interactions with community help clear confusions along with gaining other perspectives. And gamification features like earning tokens and having a friendly competition with friends helps keep the excitement alive to read. Um, next we have minimum viable product. So points and rewards. Instead of having a large amount of rewards, the platform should have few rewards, such as points or tokens for completing reading tasks. So um, since we don't, we're going to work on this feature more, of course, once we actually um, get the product like above the minimal viable product. But of course, like for starters, we want to still keep this gamification factor alive, but we might not want to invest as much just to see how people are liking it. Um, secondly, we have progress tracking. The platform should incorporate simple progress tracking that indicates reading progress. So, of course, people want to know their progress, and we may add um, advancements later, but for now, like, we might keep a progress bar, like, you're doing really good, like, you're reading this many books per week. And um, I think that would help the reader a lot, just knowing how they read. Um, Thirdly, we have amount of books fo focusing on a small selection of ebooks will ensure quality, decrease investment cost, and avoid overwhelming users with too many choices. So I think personally that like we can have authors on both sides, and um, like we might start not by offering authors like to buy things on our platform maybe because we want to like first buy maybe buy some books by license and then put them on the platform just to like see how it works out with one side and then we might test the other side again um, lastly we have development of platforms so developing a simple mobile app will make the app easier to access so we might not put that much like investment into graphics or like things like this and Honestly, I think we can uh, work on that as the company grows and um, of course this is the minimal viable product so I think this is all we need pretty much for a basic product and like a basic overview of what exactly this company does. Uh, next we have critical assumptions. So over here I've had reference like whatever assumptions are made in the slide and the financial statements have their own separate one on another page. Um, in the same sheet so I will show you guys that later but this these are the critical assumptions that I have referenced as letters um, you can take a look at that later and um, next we have competitive analysis so e-learning opportunities and challenges so the opportunities we have here is that growing literacy concerns continue to rise so this means that we can target like more parents or um, we can help like improve, of course, with um, children's literacy and we can also, you know, cash in on a little. Next, we have more children owning electronic devices. As you know, most middle schoolers these days own like iPhones or like even Android iPhones and they're so engaged on social media. But instead of having engagement on social media, instead, if they had a similar platform which provided like reading features instead, it would keep them like it would still keep them interested in doing things like this and it would also contribute to of course improving their like literacy levels. Next we have data driven personalization. So Often, like most people struggle with finding the right book to read and they often spend a lot of time finding just a book. So this platform is of course going to help with that. And next we have global accessibility. So not just people that like have enough money or like you can have a free trial on this app too. But um, global accessibility means that people from around the world can write books, um, discuss with each other, and I think that's going to be a pretty cool experience. Next, we have some challenges with um, obtaining this platform. So we have obtaining ebooks. So we might need to collaborate with some authors to start with, but once we have a two-sided market, we can um, have like more authors joining our platform. Next, we have user engagement. So um, this comes under marketing cost, but um, I expect that 
like we might need to spend a little money on marketing on social media and stuff to get users engaged so that's might not be such a big challenge and lastly we have parental concerns about excessive screen time so i think that this challenge can also be overcome because like if you spend the little time you have on the screen valuably then you get a larger effect and this might not be such a big problem after all because parents might not be so concerned afterward if they know that their child is up to something good on the device like that next we have our competitors so like after uh, researching we decided that we have two like main competitors that people often enjoy to use a lot and they provide similar features to novel nook but not exactly the same so over here we have a website called sora so this also this company provides e-libraries to schools and i think that's probably one of their bigger like customers next we have the strengths so we have like closer integration with schools and libraries which um, means that they're a really reliable company and I honestly think after gathering like a amount of audience the same thing could like happen to Novel Nook as well um, schools might tie up with this to sort of discuss with their class like what's going on in the book that they're reading and it'll be a really interesting feature um, nextly we have another strength is wide variety of content caters to um, diverse reading interests so honestly i think that this challenge will um become like we can overcome this challenge as the company gains fame next we have epic so epic is a large uh, has a large variety of traditional books and audiobooks along with educational resources so like i mentioned earlier most companies like this often are based on traditional book systems unlike novel nook you can, um, there's other additional features that help gamify the process of reading. Um, additionally, they are targeted to a broad age range of 5 to 12. So we have around the same age from elementary to middle schoolers. And um, I think this might be a bigger competitor compared to Sora. Um, so this company also provides badges, um, learning quizzes and a virtual library which I think will not be that hard to compete with as Novel Nook has a bigger feature one of the main features is a discussion feature um, nextly we have next we have competitive advantages in Novel Nook so first we have social and interactive features so you can share book recommendations confusions and gain others insights so I think this is a very helpful feature because sometimes people will be confused when reading a book and they might walk away with a confused idea on the book. So interacting with others or talking about the book sort of provides like a book club environment and it also sort of gives a social media interacting um, experience. Next we have enhanced gamification. So since, as I mentioned earlier as well, this uh, platform provides a lot of gamification features, which will make it very interesting for a lot of people because uh, often reading a book can sometimes be daunting or tedious, but um, like when you don't want a task to be so mundane, uh, gamification like earning something, a reward system sort of helps motivate your mind more. Uh, next, we have data-driven personalization. So we, like I said earlier, modern features like AI can help um, do this, which are not found in other competitors that we have. So that's like honestly a really good advantage. Um, next, we have user control over reading. So you can explore like any genre you want, and it honestly has a very advanced um, searching feature where you can explore different genres or different types of formats even in the book. So I don't think that any of our competitors will have this idea. Next, we have customer acquisition. So we have a little bit of calculations here, but um, before that, we have a process of how are we going to acquire customers. So a few things we can do to acquire customers is search engine optimization. So optimizing the platform or app um, to rank higher in search engine results for relevant keywords. So this is might be like maybe come as the last priority because firstly, we want people to come to the company 
just knowing like how featureful it is or how interesting they might think it is. Um, next we have social media marketing. So engaging with target audience on platforms they use most. So often when people will see that platforms like this are engaging, they might like develop a sense of interest as they see that more and more people are starting to use it. Um, next we have community engagement. So partnering with local initiatives or supporting social causes will um, help will like inform people more about such things and it'll also provide a chance to sort of donate to a good cause. Next we have influencer marketing. Collaborate with influencers on platforms the target audience uses most. So um, maybe having a company sponsored by an influencer, which more people follow, will inspire people to use our platform as well to manage their reading. Lastly, we have free trials or demos. So this will provide a sense of the company and free trials often, like most of the time when people have free trials, they often end up paying for a subscription eventually because they love it so much. So when you provide a free like window to the customer to see what exactly are you providing, it really like intrigues them to go ahead and buy a subscription to whatever they want. Um, so next we have a calculation here. Um, I've added like these numbers and the assumptions as well. And we can like go over this. Um, we can come back to this later as well. Um, this cost is also included in the financial sheets. So overall, the customer acquisition cost for one user is $30. And that's at the beginning stage of the company. And I believe that it will not like appear as, um, as a big number as it is right now when the company starts to grow more. Next, we have unit economics. So we have a price to the customer and um, basically, in order to calculate that, we have some reasoning over here. So the <coughs> the basic factors for the company are content acquisition, platform development, and maintenance. So I think these are the main factors that go into maintaining the company and keeping it like running well and having a good like reputation for people to come back to the company or even... Um, like encourage people to buy a subscription. So first of all, we have content acquisition. So we have a two-sided market as mentioned earlier. So authors will get paid for writing based on how many people follow their profile and publishing on the platform. So um, if an author pays for a subscription, they'll have more tools provided to them for editing or they might even have like a writing feature um, when they pay for a subscription. So we have an average payment for trending authors like $5,000 per month and that's a rough estimate and as you can see I've referenced it to the assumptions. So next we have the estimated customer lifetime value. So we have like a little bit of calculations here and in the assumptions uh, once again I've mentioned um, what is accounted for when um, thinking of these numbers. And some of these are also linked to the financial plans. So the customer lifetime value, like average, is $126.80. And I believe that will go up in the future as well. Uh, next, we have sales forecast. <coughs> so over here, we've used the Acord model to analyze what exactly um over here, we use the Acord model to see what exactly, um, how, how much sales do we forecast in the company. So first we have advantage. Um, author driven models require a wider content variety, um, delivers a wider content variety, encouraging deeper and next we have sales forecast. So we have the Acord model. So this is used to analyze um, the sales forecast in the company and through like what advantages you have, what risks you have, etc. So let's start. So first we have advantages. The, so the author driven model delivers a wider content variety, encouraging deeper reader engagement and a unique competitive edge. So this is sort of like um, inspired by like a video uploading platform and it's sort of as if like 
it motivates the author as well to write more and it encourages the reader to read more as well. Next, we have compatibility. So it matches the interests of the target audience, ensuring a noteworthy user experience for both readers and authors. So since like AI generated like recommended books that might be recommended to readers, it matched the interests of the target audience. And um, I feel that this will really be a compatibility like platform for those types of people that we're targeting. Next, we have complexity. So user-friendly interfaces minimize confusion, encouraging rapid subscriber acquisition and author participation. So the complexity of the platform is not a lot, which um, will honestly help readers understand the platform more instead of having to spend more time figuring out what is what. Next, we have observability. So it, uh, leverage data analytics to track key metrics, allowing to refine marketing strategies, optimize content acquisition, and continuously improve for user satisfaction. Then we have risk. Users have no risk in using this product as the variety of genres will attract them to renew their subscription to explore more. Divisibility. Our modular platform is built for scalability, seamlessly accommodating for a growing user base and future feature additions to further enhance user engagement. So over here we have like a small calculation and all of this data is referenced in the um, reference links at the end of the presentation. So um, as you can see, these are all the numbers that we predict um, will like appear. Next we have branding and naming. So um, the good thing about this domain is that it has no hyphens or special characters, which makes it uh, more easier to remember. It's .com and not .net or .org. It includes .com, as mentioned earlier. Customers know what it does after looking at the name. So you can like sort of guess that it's something relevant to reading after looking at the name Novel Nook. Um, it's easy to pronounce and it's easy to spell which helps um, with the overall remembrance of the name, and it's also short. Um, next, we have the team. So the team includes the CEO, and um, the skills that we, need, we would find in the CEO are strong leadership and strategic thinking abilities, proven track record of success in growing businesses, excellent communication, and the interpersonal skills, um, deep understanding of the industry and market trends, and decisive and result oriented. So um, th these skills would mainly help in managing a large company or a large team in general, and it would really help the company like stay on track towards its goal. Um, so the hiring approach we might use for these are structured interviews with a clear set of questions that will evaluate leadership experience and the other um, skills that we want to find in the CEO. Next, we have the CTO. So the skills needed are strong technical skills in software development and experience building user-friendly platforms. Uh, familiarity with scalable size. So this would mainly help because um, by having a CTO like that, we could manage like a technical team and have the company ready for um, things like maybe um, some technical malfunction and happens and the team should be able to manage that so the hiring approach we have is structured interviews the same thing as a ceo but um, instead using like the skills from the cto officer um, we also need a head of marketing so the we need skills of uh, skills that we need to have found in the head of marketing are record of successful marketing campaigns, abilities to measure results, experience with digital marketing, and user acquisition strategies. So this will help the company grow its user base by a lot because more users means like more business and that means we can invest more into the company again. So the hiring approach is focusing on past achievements and results. Um, using interviews to assess their understanding of the target audience and ability to develop data-driven marketing strategies. So it's more like a structured interview similar to what I've mentioned before in the team. Next, we have finance. So we have um, this budget um, for the company. And <clears throat> if we click on the link over here, we can see that um, we have 
So we have like the platform development and maintenance, as I've mentioned earlier. And we also have a timeline sort of when like we need to like how much money are we going to spend in this much time? So um, over here we have platform development and maintenance. And from April 2024 to September 2024, it'd be $1,170,575. Uh, for that next we have marketing and sales so mainly the um, head of marketing would be in charge of these expenses but uh, we have since the company will probably launch in September we have costs for um, in September for social media advertising 3,000 social media engagement or presence $9,074 then we have the influencer market, like getting sponsored by some an influencer that a lot of people follow, $1,000. And the total of all of those in September would be $13,074. Then we have a remote office workspace. So I think having a remote office workspace will decrease the cost of our uh, it'll decrease the cost of having a physical workspace and having to have um, rent out a building or have furniture in the office, have like a dedicated workspace for each employee. So um, a remote office workspace from April to September for engineers working on the platform, uh, we have a budget of $80,000. Um, for devices and equipment. Then we have remote work platforms. So platforms like Zoom where the company will meet or some platforms that um, the company's employees can interact through. Um, we have a budget for $120 on that. So in total, we have $80,120 um, for remote office workspace. And that is our budget plan. So next we have um, the financing plan. So um, over here, like, we have the personal savings, and the personal savings come from, like, me, the founder. So $366,405.50 we have from personal savings, and we have the same amount from a bank loan, um, which we will eventually pay off as the company grows larger and larger. Then money from investors, we would require $420,000 and five, um, four hundred twenty thousand and five hundred dollars and then the revenue that we might generate from the company that would get reinvested as i've mentioned earlier and the revenue average would make one thousand four hundred dollars in like about a month then we have our income statement so over here we have our revenue so our sources of revenue are subscription license revenue and other revenue um, like from advertisements on our uh, free trial portion of Novel Nook. Then we have a uh, cost of goods, so hosting expenses. Um, so for example, hosting the platform on a website will cost some money. So we've accounted for that. Um, internal engineering salaries, so like platform development and etc. Then customer success, which is retention based, and we have um, experienced like people that can deal with customers if they're having difficulties or something relevant to that. And we have a total cost of goods. Uh, we've calculated the gross profit from that and the gross profit margin. Next, we have operating expenses. So we have marketing, which was also mentioned in the budget. We um, also, these are all included in like assumptions and everything as like this is not realistic data from the company, it's a prediction. Um, then we have product development. Um, for example, like how much is it gonna like take for you to develop the product? So I think that would come under um, platform, like platform development. Um, then we have general admin and administrative costs. So we have like just general expenses around the company. Uh, we have prepaid rent. Um, even though I mentioned we have a physical, we don't have a physical office workspace. Um, sometimes the company might need to meet together and really like think things through. So we have a, a separate like physical space for that. Um, then we have sales commissions, interest expense, and depreciation expense. So interest expense and depreciation expense like mainly come from things um, like the physical office space or the bank loan um, interest expense. 
Next, we have our balance statement. So over here, um, we have made sure that the total assets match with the to total liabilities and shareholders' equity. Um, so we have computing equipments, um, and we have a cost mentioned for that. We have um, minus the accumulated depreciation on those. And then we have the cash that comes in the company through revenue or personal investments. Um, then we have the accounts receivable. So how many accounts do we have money due from? We have prepaid rent, which I mentioned um, before this. We, and then, like I said earlier, um, the inventory for this company would be zero because we're not producing anything that's like physical. So that would be zero for the company. It's like a one-time cost, and then you sort of add on to that occasionally. Um, next, we have liabilities. So accounts payable, how much we have due. Um, then we have like a lot of liabilities, like long-term liabilities, unearned income, etc. Um, and part of equity, we have a stock, uh, which is a very rough estimate. Then we have a net income, which is taken from the income statement. And we also, we don't have any dividends for the company. Um, so that's the balance statement. Then we have the cash flow statement, in which we've included the net, com net income and cash flows from operating activities. So the net income adjustments for cash flow and under that comes under depreciation um, and loss on sales equipment. So we've included costs for that. Then we have an increase in accounts receivable. So um, an increase in accounts that have money due to us. Um, next we have decrease in prepaid expenses. So um, decrease in prepaid expenses like prepaid rent or et cetera. Um, decrease in accounts payable would come under like um, how many accounts like less do we have to pay um, then we have capital expenditures expenditures and then we have proceeds from sale of equipment so if you are going to resell um, an equipment that somebody that was fired or somebody that quit their job and you need to sell the equipment like the laptop or whatever um, so we don't plan on doing that for the first three years then we have proceeds from issuing debt and dividends paid. Um, then we have net increase in cash during the year, cash at the beginning of the year, and cash at the end of the year. And all of these match with the numbers given in previous statements. So we have all of the assumptions and everything um, mentioned, the references, etc. mentioned in this um, slide, which we can always look back to later. Next, um, we have all of these statements and lastly we have the references so thank you for listening to this pitch deck and thank you for investing your time in this i hope you also invest some of your money in this as well and i think i really thank you for your time here